we're really, really glad to have Yuran Ma um, from Chicago Booth um, join, join us today. Um, you know, she's done a lot of work on various dimensions of belief formation. Um, and, um, you know, she just introduced her own work, I think, really well. So I'm not going to add any more except hand over the floor to, to you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you to everyone for being here. And this work is about uh, understanding expectations formation. It's joined with Asana Bruce at Columbia, Spencer Kwan at Harvard, Augusta Landia at uh, uh, HCC Paris, and David Tesmar at MIT. So expectations are central to economic analysis. A growing literature, um, including what you may have seen, uh, Johanna's work and Teresa's work, um, have shown that expectations are very important for example for explaining um, decision making and that also leads to a very important issue which is to understand the structures of belief formation what shapes beliefs and do they deviate from standard frictions benchmarks as we all know the standard frictions benchmark in economics for decades is the full information rational expectations and, and framework and that has influenced economic analysis in many domains um, however, that type of uh, frictionless benchmark has been challenged uh, over the years, initially by indirect evidence, for example, Schiller's evidence of excess uh, volatility in stock prices and the observation of uh, Minsky and Kindleberger about macroeconomic fluctuations, financial market, credit market fluctuations that do not seem to be fully explained um, if you insist that people hold uh, fully rational expectations. And more recently, um, the full information rational expectation benchmark has been further challenged by a grown literature that collects direct evidence and data on expectations and analyze the structures of expectations. So a, a growing amount of studies ha, um, have documented that there are systematic biases when you look at the data of expectations and forecasts that people make. A number of papers have uh, found significant overreaction in different settings to various degrees, but there are also some papers that find uh, indications of underreaction. So in different settings, we've seen um, somewhat different uh, uh, types of biases, sometimes in signs, sometimes the magnitude, and uh, you of course, want to understand why and what, what is a way to integrate the evidence across different domains. Some of the suggested evidence that I've noticed uh, in the past few years when analyzing these data is there seems to be more overreaction when we're looking at more transitory processes. And one uh, type of evidence is in a recent paper joined with uh, Petro Pradalo, Nicola Ginelli, and Andre Schleifer, where we collect data on forecasts of 20 uh, series um, about different macroeconomics and financial market outcomes from the survey of professional forecasters and the blue chip survey. And there you can compare the forecasts and the biases associated with different types of series. And we tend to find that there is more overreaction in processes that are uh, more transitory. There's on average, uh, overreaction, but particularly pronounced in those cases. Now, um, although this uh, evidence is quite interesting and suggests some potential for unification uh, across evidence in different domains, there are certain um, important limitations for using survey data in the field. First of all, for these uh, macro and financial series, researchers often do not know the true data generating process, and that makes measuring the degree of bias is somewhat tricky. And even more importantly, uh, we do not know forecasters' information set, so we do not necessarily know what they're responding to, and that also makes uh, being able to measure the degree of biases for uh, the types of biases in the first place rather challenging. One way to work around this, if you uh, take a look at the paper with the Petro and Nicola and Andre is to um, capture updating using forecast revisions and use forecast revisions as a summary statistic of the information that forecasters respond to and see how forecast revisions 
then predict forecast errors to people overshoot or undershoot. But still, what you, one could get from that type of approach and how to interpret those coefficients is model dependent and depends on the underlying DGP. So there are quite a bit of challenges. Um, and what uh, I will discuss today is a work that tries to understand um, fundamentally how biases vary across settings depending on the features of the process. Uh, now, using a very simple randomized experiment where we ask people to forecast a very simple, the most uh, simple class of statistical processes, we know the data generating process. We can randomly assign people to different conditions and we can control the relevant information set reasonably well. So in the end, we can measure biases very cleanly and measure the degree of them uh, in different settings. And then we can uh, have a better understanding of what's the unifying um, framework for thinking about the types of biases that we observe in different settings. So as a preview of the result, um, we ask people to forecast simple R1 processes with different levels of persistence, and we randomly assign people to conditions with different levels of persistence. We find that there is overall significant overreaction, and I will define overreaction and how we measure it uh, very soon. And in particular, the overreaction is especially strong for processes that are more transitory. And also, we find that existing models that have been proposed do not seem to fit this key pattern in the data very well. And then uh, we'll go on to then propose uh, a framework, a modeling framework of expectations formation that captures um, a very uh, intuitive observation of along the lines of recency bias and the fact that recent observations may have a disproportionate influence on judgment and uh, belief formation. And then we show that the simple framework, which of course can be applied in many settings, uh, if applied to the setting of the data of these air one forecasts, um, we find that the, they fit the data and the way they uh, vary with different settings really well. So hopefully um, the, both the uh, evidence and the theory help us to make uh, a step forward towards having an under unifying understanding of expectation biases and how to integrate the evidence across different settings. There is a growing literature on expectations I already mentioned, and this work is in particular connected to three strands of research. If you're interested, you can also read uh, these uh, papers listed here. So first of all, as I mentioned, there is a growing literature on understanding the structure and the biases and expectations using survey forecast data. And secondly, there's also uh, prior work on uh, studying forecasting in experimental settings. Typically, the previous experiments were um, particularly interested in testing one type of model in one type of setting. And what we're um, hoping to do here is to test it in different settings and in particular to compare the performance of different models to, to understand the strength and weaknesses of the models that have been proposed. And third is, uh, as you will see, the type of a mechanism that we try to formalize in our model to explain the data is connected with a very recent branch of work on building psychologically founded models of expectations formation. And several of them uh, draw inspiration from psychology research on the importance of um, how people utilize information um, based on mechanism connected memory to capture the idea that um, expectations formation doesn't happen in a vacuum, how we draw information is shaped by uh, what comes to mind. I will first start with experimental design and then I will show the main results and the extent to which existing models can explain uh, or fail to explain uh, the, the key results that we find and then I will explain the modeling framework we propose and then additional predictions that follow from the framework. So first of all, the experimental design, we designed the experiment to be as simple as possible. And the forecasting is a very uh, straightforward task to forecast AR1 processes. Um, we present uh, people with uh, 40 
historical realizations uh, up, uh, upon the uh, at the beginning of the experiment. So you can already see 40 past realizations. And then uh, people are asked to make 40 rounds of forecast uh, in the baseline of the realization, the next round and T plus two. Um, and then we uh, compensate people in a standard way that is increasing in the forecast accuracy. In particular, given that this forecasting uh, task is designed to be very simple, there's no hidden private information and historical realization of the process is all that is relevant. So the information set is very simple and very well defined. And then uh, we will randomly assign people first into uh, AR1 processes with different levels of persistence row. And the row varies from zero to one. And in addition, as you will see, we also will uh, test the impact of different forecast horizons and uh, other dimensions. Uh, or for example, whether it makes a difference to tell, um, to uh, say it's a random, simple, random, stable, random process versus it's explicitly saying it's an AR1 process. Uh, we'll come back to this very soon. The participants, um, a large group of the participants come from the uh, online platform that Amazon has built that uh, a grow number of experimental researchers using. And this allows us to access participants from across the US with pretty diverse demographics. They are generally uh, younger than the general populations, somewhat better educated. So you can actually um, have a lot of college graduates that's higher than the general population. Um, they um, are geographically very diverse and very similar to the US population distribution. And, um, and recently, I think in my experience, um, you can access thousands of people uh, pretty easily in, in the matter of hours. Um, so it's a, a really a very convenient way to be able to uh, perform very large scale experiments. And for the test that I mentioned on testing whether giving a linear AR1 prior has any impact, um, for this we will uh, test it using MIT undergrads who are required to take statistical classes as part of their requirements so they understand what it means to uh, say that a process is AR1. So this is a simple demonstration of what the experimental interface looks like. You start with by seeing the historical patterns uh, and, and the, the values of historical realization. So it's kind of like a Bloomberg screen. You see the charts and you see the values. And then the predicting task is to indicate your forecast of um, future realizations uh, by clicking on these uh, bars. And then people will see their historical scores, the total scores and so on. And once they've decided, they uh, click on make prediction and then a new realization will um, show up and then they will move on and forecast the next, in the next round. And this we will iterate 40 times. Now, um, the, after we collect the data, we first want to um, define the way we uh, detect biases. So the very simple way to look at the behavior of the forecast is to say, uh, let's just say, if we have the, the true um, data generating process, the, the persistence row, but if you look at the forecast, the, the forecast implied uh, persistence, you can just take the forecast, regress it on the most recent realization, it's going to be uh, denoted by this row S for the implied or subjective persistence. And this plot is the most important plot in the empirical part where the x-axis plots the true data generating process, uh, the per true persistence row that goes from zero to one. Um, and then the y-axis plots the implied persistence in each uh, condition. So this we can calculate by pulling all the forecasts in one condition, in that condition, running this regression of pulled way, or we can do it uh, forecaster by forecaster, and then take the mean or median uh, per person implied persistence. Either way, the results are very similar. And so what this pattern, sh this picture shows is that um, there is a gap often between the implied persistence and the actual persistence. 
the gap is not very big for the high persistence process. And so you see that it, when it's one and the true persistence, it, um, it's one and the uh, implied persistence is close to one. But as the actual persistence become lower, you will see that the gap becomes increasingly large. Um, for example, when the, the true process is close to IID, the implied persistence is definitely greater than zero. And so the fact that the implied persistence is greater than the actual persistence, that's one way to define overreaction in the sense that people think the most recent realization is going to have a much more impact on um, future observations then it's actually the case. So, um, and then there's increasing in overreaction when the process is less persistent. Uh, and that's very visually evident if you just look at the difference where actually it's somewhat more um, proper to define it as a ratio, but because the first difference is already increasing when the row becomes lower, the ratio between the row S and the row uh, definitely increases more. So this is the key pattern that there is overreaction, meaning the implied persistence tends to be higher than the true persistence, and in particularly the case when the true process is not very persistent is, or is more transitory. So this is the key picture that we see. Of course, we do a lot of robustness checks to understand uh, the robustness of this result. We uh, have done splits for different subgroups and especially different demographics. That's really robust across different demographics. You can see it in the appendix of the paper if you're interested. We've done splits between the first and second half of the, uh, of the test, and then we haven't seen substantial differences in the structural forecast uh, over time in, in the first or second half of the um, analysis. And uh, we have also um, used in sample the square learning as the benchmark, the rational benchmark, because of course the DGP in a finite sample doesn't necessarily manifest itself exactly the way the, the row is uh, defined to be. And so uh, the, there can be some gaps and we've done that check as well. Uh, we've also, as I mentioned, explicitly provided AR1 prior, that doesn't seem to make a, a meaningful difference either. So now we want to understand what underlies these, this key pattern, what can explain it. And uh, we've tested a, a number of existing models, uh, roughly uh, grouped into two buckets. The first bucket, what's called backward looking models, is mainly to say that they have a fixed dependence, uh, or in these models, the forecasts have a fixed dependence on past realizations, like uh, the traditional extrapolative or adaptive or the forward-looking models, meaning that the forecast actually incorporate the rational expectations plus some deviation from the rational expectation. So it will adapt to the context based on what's the rational benchmark in that context plus some deviation, like uh, diagnostic ex expectation, the, the subjective forecast is objective, plus an overreaction to the most recent um, shock and then there are other examples of this as well. This is the picture of the fit of these models. And the way we fit the models is we just uh, pull all the data together and we minimize the mean squared error between the model implied forecast and uh, the actual forecast to, to get at the key parameters in these models and, and then ask if we, once we get the key parameters, what's the implied uh, persistence that's generated by these models with the fitted parameters. So the blue line indicates again what we see in the data as the pattern of the implied persistence of the true forecast, the actual forecast, and then these are what the models would generate. So the first group of models that specify fixed dependence on past observations, they generate a line that's much too flat, so they don't have enough dependence of how the property of the forecast relative to the true uh, process, true persistence, whereas the second class of models that try to adapt uh, to the setting based on the rational expectations, they adapt too much and you see they're almost a 45 degree line, so they're not that different from the rational expectations, especially in the low persistence processes. Um, many of the, those models actually collapse 
to rational expectations, whereas in the data, we do not find that to be the case. So the basic summary of that is uh, the traditional backward-looking models that specify fixed dependence. They don't generate enough dependence to the context. The existing quote-unquote forward-looking models that adapt to the setting based on rational expectations, they are too close to rational expectations. And then um, we proposed a simple framework to uh, understand expectations formation and the biases, uh, which is building on a very simple intuition that people may overweight uh, recent observations, but we micro found it in a way that's inspired by recent, uh, 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 by uh, this, the accumulating evidence from psychology research. So what we do here is we have an AR1 process that people are asked to forecast and they produce forecasts uh, that's denoted by F. And in particular, for simplicity, we assume that people need, don't know the true long run mean and need to estimate the long run mean. And for simplicity, we assume that they know the actual uh, process persistence row. You will see that we've mostly focused the biases on mu because this is the most parsimonious way to generate the variation of biases, not just with respect to persistence, but also later on with respect to forecast horizon. If we just say, let's uh, postulate that people use the wrong row instead of using row, people using would use row hat, in that case, biases would diminish as the forecast horizon go to very long, because then if you have row hat that take many uh, power, then it, it becomes very small. So uh, that's not a, the most satisfactory way to deliver some of the key results. And, and also working with the bias about the mean is very parsimonious and, and simple. So uh, what we do is we uh, uh, set up a framework where people can observe the, recent, the most recent observation, and then they can utilize past information, but subject to a cost. So it's not so easy to bring everything back uh, on top of the mind and the most recent information might be especially available on top of the mind. And so this is the forecasting problem, minimizing mean squared errors subject to a cost of utilizing past information. And the cost uh, is uh, use, uses um, the, the Shannon mutual information, which you can, if you are interested in technical detail, can see the paper. What this model would deliver is the forecast is going to be, again, um, a function of the rational forecast, like many of the other models we've seen, plus the term of overreaction that's coming from overweighting the most recent observation. And this overreaction is going to be higher uh, when the process is less persistent. It's going to collapse to zero when the process is a random walk and row is equal to one. And uh, the intuition is, again, that people rely too much on most recent observations to infer the long run mean, what we have seen um, recently looms very large in our mind and shapes our thinking about the world in general. So uh, here is a very simple plot of the model fit. Again, we fit this model the, the same way we fit other models, pick the parameter, the key parameter in the model that governs the memory cost, uh, and then fit it based on minimizing mean squared error with respect to the data and then plot the model implied persistence, which is these red dots, and then compared with the data. With, and then here we see a very uh, close uh, fit. We have also analyzed the implication of this model for forecast horizon. And in particular, there is uh, increasing indication in the survey data or in asset prices that there is more overreaction for longer horizon forecasts. Um, and so in our data, we also have longer horizon forecasts, meaning that forecast for T plus two and then in the next slide T plus one. So one can also calculate the implied persistence drawn from, uh, calculated from this, uh, these longer horizon forecasts. Again, the blue line is what you see in the data. The red dots are what our model would predict um, based on, um, minimizing the mean squared error with respect to the data. And then these other dots are what the, the other models would predict based, uh, based on the same model fit procedure. 
And again, the, um, the traditional models tend to be too close to the 45 degree line. Some of them do slightly better than others, but uh, uh, to be able to capture the, the data, um, the, our formulation uh, has a superior performance. And this plot is uh, an, just a different forecast horizon T plus five. And again, you will see that the, this, uh, the model forecast and the data forecasts have very similar properties. And also here, the row, the, the gap between uh, the actual persistence and the implied persistence uh, kind of widens a little bit, which is close to what I was saying, that uh, overreaction tends to increase also in horizon. OK, so here's a summary of uh, what I uh, covered uh, in the past uh, half an hour. Um, I will hope that you can remember the key fact uh, from this very simple test that there is often overreaction. It is especially persistent, uh, uh, especially pronounced for less persistent processes. And we see this pretty robustly in this simple um, randomized experiment that allows us to isolate this uh, key pattern very clearly, but we also see indications from field data as well. And uh, then to think about uh, this pattern, the existing expectations models do have some limitations in terms of how much they can capture the degree uh, to which the data adjusts to the actual setting. Some models imply too little adjustment, some models imply too much adjustment. And we propose a framework for thinking about expectations formation by um, formalizing uh, this, uh, the recency bias based on that most recent observation can come to mind more easily, whereas past information is more costly to utilize. Of course, um, you might ask whether this may get diminished if we go out uh, to a high stakes setting. Uh, we already know from uh, years of prior work that even in high stakes setting, um, people do exhibit a lot of the robust biases, the way the brain is wired doesn't make this the case of once we go to a high stakes setting that we think uh, fundamentally differently, especially the psychology research shows very solid foundations for these ways of thinking. And also um, in many high stakes setting, we are assisted by a richer set of tools for sure. And that effectively can model it as a lower cost of utilizing past information. But in those settings, you also often have discretionary judgment. Uh, even traders, for example, need to use their discretion a lot, in which case this type of um, natural way, the, the way we think and the way that most recent information tends to loom large, uh, color the way we think about the world can still be relevant. And um, so we have discussed a little bit the impact of the implications for forecast horizon. Um, and I would want to say one thing about overreaction versus underreaction. As you see from the talk in the experiment, we found primarily overreaction. There's some uh, evidence in some settings of finding underreaction. So how do we generate underreaction if, if it's necessary? So the key friction that we have in this framework is the imperfect utilization of past information not imperfect perception of recent information. Recent information is easily perceived and that's quite fitting in a transparent setting like what we have in the experiment. However, if you live in a setting where the perception of recent information is noisy because of uh, imperfect attention or because there's too many things to process, the imperfect perception of recent information uh, can lead to underreaction. If we add that element on, on top of what we currently have in the model, then of course we can deliver uh, underreaction as well. So uh, let me end here. And if uh, you have questions, I will be back uh, at 5 p.m. East to address the questions. Thank you, Yaron. This was really super interesting. And I think it's great that everyone gets to hear from you yourself. I especially like on your last slide how you point out how this is really you know, the lab experiment is very complementary to the field evidence that we see. And I think that really highlights um, some of the strength of the lab experiments that we can actually take some of the, um, you know, kind of some of the ideas we get from field data and test them in a more clearly controlled way and like really dig in, okay, in the field, this could be, um, 
consistent with a bunch of possible um, data generating processes, updating processes, and we can't possibly control that in the field, but we can take it to the lab and then we can control all these things. So I do think these are very, very complementary, and I thought it was great that you uh, highlighted that. Yeah, one, one other thing I want to just point out that I like a lot about this work and also some of, you know, some of your other work that you that you talked about with, you know, Andre and others is, you know, in some ways, I think, you know, the empirical literature for a while now has made quite some progress in sort of showing various deviations of belief formation from rational expectations. But I think it has made less progress in sort of actually proposing alternative theory frameworks that would then allow you to make out of sample predictions, et cetera. And so I, my, my sense has been for a while that where, you know, this, this, this field of, you know, belief studying needs to go to next is to somehow take all this evidence, you know, that, you know, Teresa also reviewed in the beginning that, you know, beliefs are driven by stuff that's local on lots of dimensions, et cetera, and try and build frameworks that allow you, you know, that are tractable enough that you can then include them in bigger models that allow out of sample predictability, out of setting predictability, et cetera. And my sense is that now a lot of behavioral economics fell down and that it never never effectively went that last step, right? It was all about showing how, you know, rationality failed. And and so I'm really glad to see you do this great work, really, you know, not just documenting it, et cetera, linking it to field evidence, linking it to psychology research, but then also just saying, okay, let, let me write down a model. Let me, you know, and, 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 you know, really actually propose an alternative to the existing model. So, you know, we can come back to sort of that in, in the panel discussion too, but I already wanted to point it out to people right now that I think um, that's really important and, and I think is going to get even more important going forward. So thanks. Thanks, Joran.